Republicans have been quite busy taking full advantage of their investigative power in the House in the short time since winning the majority. Just this week, the Oversight Committee held seven hearings on topics ranging from the origins of COVID-19 to the migrant crisis at the Mexico border. And I'm not exactly sure what they expect to discover here, the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. That committee also sent a letter to the D.C. mayor on Thursday announcing an investigation into whether January 6 defendants have been mistreated in D.C. jail. Meanwhile, when House Democrats on the Oversight Committee this week asked Republicans to join them in denouncing white nationalism and white supremacy in all its forms, including the Great Replacement conspiracy theory, all 20 Democrats signed the letter and all 26 Republicans refused, which is wow. And today, one day after President Joe Biden unveiled his 2024 budget plan, members of the Freedom Caucus announced that they will only agree to a budget that slashes $131 billion from current spending levels. And those cuts cannot include defense spending or entitlement programs and no tax increases, which is some real tough math. Instead, the Freedom Freedom Caucus is eyeing cuts to student debt relief and COVID and climate change funding and adding work requirements to Medicaid. This all comes as the House Weaponization Committee has hit a rough patch. This week, we learned from The Washington Post that Congressman Jim Jordan is facing criticism from the right over his lackluster performance thus far. The Post reports, quote, critics say the committee has been too slow to staff up, insufficiently aggressive in issuing subpoenas for interviews and testimony, and lacking in substance. Jordan defended his committee's work to the Post and pointed to the number of subpoenas it has issued. But his colleague on the Judiciary Committee, Congressman Eric Swalwell, had some choice words about Congressman Jordan asking anyone to comply with a subpoena. So we're going to haul witnesses in here today uh, and claim that they did not comply with subpoenas or requests. And that request is so rich because it's coming from a chairman who himself did not comply with the January 6th committee's request. So May 31, you see a letter sent to then-Representative Jordan asking that he honor his subpoena. He was asked over and over and over, you were a witness to a crime. You were a witness to the greatest crime ever committed with the most criminals ever indicted in America. Will you help your country? Will you comply with that subpoena? No compliance, crickets, absolute defiance of the subpoena. Joining us now is Democratic Congressman Eric Swalwell of California. He is, of course, a member of the House Judiciary Committee. Congressman Swalwell, thank you for being here, and thank you for using the the term crickets in an actual um, House (laughs) testimony. Uh, I I do have to ask you, and this is not a rhetorical question, do you think that Jim Jordan understands the hypocrisy here to issue these subpoenas when he himself did not comply with the subpoena and be outraged about the lack of people showing up for his subpoenas? Uh, Not at all. It it is completely uh, lost on him, uh, Alex. And and in fact, uh, the Department of Justice showed up and they were willing to do what he was not willing to do. And they raised their right hand, gave testimony, cooperated. It wasn't so hard. And uh, he, uh, though, still remains out of compliance and not willing to honor his oath and give testimony about a crime that he witnessed. As part, parts of the party want to relitigate January 6, when Marjorie Taylor Greene and Jim Comer are going to D.C. J- jail and talking about the January 6 plaintiffs somehow getting a raw deal and otherwise looking to investigate the investigators on the January 6 committee, wh- how do Democrats see this attempt to relitigate a dark, dark day in our nation's history? I mean, I, I understand that the truth is important, but it also seems like politically very problematic for the GOP to keep bringing up January 6th. Is it a gift to Democrats in a way? (laughs) It's entirely for one person, uh, right? Uh, They recognize and believe that Donald Trump is the leader of their party, will likely be uh, the candidate uh, for president. And they were walloped in the midterms because voters chose competency over chaos. And and so they have to rewrite January 6th. Otherwise, uh, the voters will keep rejecting them. Now, they don't realize that the voters are never going to buy this. But by going into the majority, Alex, they have formed the largest law firm in Washington, D.C., and and they have one client, and that's uh, Donald Trump. Uh, But it's it's not going to work. Uh, I promise you it'll continue to be uh, rejected. Uh, And as Donald Trump, you know, becomes closer and closer uh, to being their nominee, uh, they will have to, again, 
bring themselves closer and closer to supporting Donald Trump. And so it's no pathway to victory uh, for them. And the best thing we can do is to just remind voters what we delivered on health care, on gun safety, on infrastructure, on climate when we were in the majority, and contrast that with the chaos we're seeing now. And that's the case for putting us back into the majority next November. I mean, and I, I agree that this is for the audience of one Trump, but it does strike me that some of these Republicans like Jim Jordan and Marjorie Taylor Greene may legitimately believe that it was an inside job on January 6th, that they really are trying to get the bot to the bottom of something. And I just wonder, do you have any sense that there are any conversations happening within the Republican conference to disabuse them of these notions? Uh, no, and the reason is, is because, you know, the majority is so thin that Kevin McCarthy may be the speaker in title, but Marjorie Taylor Greene has the job. She's doing the job, and he can't uh, do anything outside of what she wants to do. It's part of a corrupt bargain that he struck to be speaker. He's on a reoccurring payment plan uh, where he has to continue to deliver for Marjorie Taylor Greene and others. So he put her, who rooted for the rioters on January 6th, on the Homeland Security Committee. We're harboring a wanted international criminal in George Santos because you can't lose that vote. We gave, he gave the 40,000 hours of sensitive security footage to Tucker Carlson because, again, that was a part of the promise. And so these payments will continue and, and they'll never have an honest conversation with themselves about what American people really want or need because this is just about Kevin McCarthy staying in power and being a vessel state uh, as a conference to the MAGA nation. I guess I wonder, I mean, it would be one thing if it was just all about Republican infighting and Kevin McCarthy and his speakership dramas, and we, we could leave it at that. But the fact of the matter is, Congress does have to do some things. And I, I think most urgently about the debt ceiling. Um, and the list of demands yeah. coming from the Freedom Caucus is, and this is a technical term, bonkers. $138 billion, I believe. No cuts to Medicaid and Social Security, thanks to Joe Biden's political maneuvering around the State of the Union. They basically have taken those off the table. No cuts to defense spending. No tax yeah. increases. What you're left with is a set of insane cuts to programs that are politically untouchable, or not untouchable, but that you can't actually make. And Kevin McCarthy somehow has to navigate yeah. this, Alex, or the uh, country is going to default. So what happens? If they weren't serious before, I hope they're serious now, because today the 19th largest bank in the United States just collapsed and hundreds of thousands of people are not getting a paycheck. So it's time to get serious. And that means paying America's bills and not screwing around with the debt ceiling to achieve something politically that you couldn't otherwise achieve. It means keeping the government open in the fall and, again, not using a government shutdown to get something you couldn't otherwise get. And and globally, it means keeping Ukraine in the fight because their fight is our fight, and we know it will come to us if they fall. And so those are the three things that they have to do. They can let the crazy out of the pot uh, in every other way. That's meaningless. Uh, but if they don't do those three things, there are real consequences. They can study the Strategic Petroleum Reserve for as long as they want, as, lo as long as they can actually do the business of covering. Out. Congressman Eric Swalwell, it's always good to That's see you. Right. Thanks for joining me on this Friday night. My pleasure.